Chapter 1 On the day of the spring equinox, the sun shone directly along the evergreen-lined drive. I stood in the drawing room window, breathlessly awaiting the stunning event. Slowly, the sun crept into place and the light beamed between the stately trees. I clapped my hands as a child would. The much longed for annual sight delighted me. Abruptly, the station trap appeared, blighting the scene. It raced along the approach, swooped around the great fountain of Neptune and halted before the entrance portico. I stepped closer to the window and shaded my eyes. The bright sunlight marred my view as the occupants descended. When the tall man moved into the portico's shade, I recognized my older brother, Joel. He stepped around the trap and bowed at the waist. A woman emerged and stood beside him. For a moment, they hesitated before the grand entranceway. A light gray cloak covered the woman from neck to ankle. A wide-brimmed hat with a long ostrich feather sat upon her bright yellow hair. Without waiting to see any more, I rushed from the drawing room into the corridor. Another door burst open further down the hallway and my other brother, Grayson, stepped out. Why is Joel here? Grayson asked, rushing in my direction. Tisn't end of term yet. We didn't expect him for another three weeks. No, tisn't, I agreed, perplexed. Who's the woman? We haven't seen her before, have we, Gray? No, we haven't, my brother agreed. Let's find out, shall we? Yes, we shall, I answered, rushing toward the grand staircase. Hurriedly, I began to descend. Grayson pranced along beside me. My middle brother never walked. His feet moved with a natural dance step. Before we reached the ground level, our father marched into the hall from his study. He purposely strode toward Joel, calling his name sharply. Yes, father? Joel halted his stride and faced our father. The woman stopped also and stepped to our brother's side purposefully. Well, father cleared his throat noisily. Well, he repeated, still hesitating. You best introduce the, the, um, young lady, son. Miss Charlotte Plum, father, Joel presented. This is my father, Lottie, Sir Joel Everstow. Pleased to meet you, ducks, Miss Charlotte Plum stated stretching out her pink-gloved hand for Papa to shake. Her high-pitched cockney voice echoed around the great hall. Grayson and I paused at the bottom of the staircase, shocked by the unaccustomed sound. Papa cleared his throat again and ogled the outstretched hand. Gently placing his hand on Lottie's wrist, Joel pushed her arm down until it dangled limply by her side. Recovering our equilibrium, Grayson and I approached Papa and stood by his side silently. We continued to ogle our brother's companion curiously. Finally, following an intermediate amount of time, Joel acknowledged our presence and introduced us. My brother, Grayson and younger sister, Priscilla, Joel muttered, avoiding our stare. Miss Charlotte Plum. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Gray stated, 
taking her hand and pressing it to his lips. The room stood still with the awkwardness of the situation. We are pleased, aren't we, Prissy? He finally questioned, breaking the silence surrounding us. The newcomer's eyebrows rose abruptly at Gray's mention of my nickname, and I do believe she stifled an unexpected giggle. I did not particularly like the moniker but, since it belonged to Grayson particularly, I put up with it. As I grew older, my brother used it less frequently. Nevertheless, it slipped out on this occasion. Won't you please step into the drawing room for a toast? Papa offered, returning to his usual politeness. I must apologize for the absence of my wife. Lady Everstow is an invalid. She spends her time in her rooms. I will make the introduction following our welcoming toast. Whatever you say, Ducky, Lottie chirped, hooking her arm through Papa's elbow. Sir Joel, I snapped, swooping past the newcomer, not Ducky. For a brief instant, my older brother's companion's face altered. She pursed her lips sharply and her gray eyes turned to dark pearls filled with hate. I threw a penetrating glare in her direction and pounded up the stairs. Her high, hollow laughter followed me until I reached the top. Pivoting. I raced along the west corridor and up the stairs to the nursery schoolroom. The rest of the party continued toward the east wing and the drawing room. By the time I reached the third floor, I had calmed down considerably. Silently, I entered the schoolroom. Deep in conversation with Mr. Blanchard, Miss Young, my governess, did not hear me enter. Grayson's tutor did not see me either. Sent down? Claudia Young questioned, her voice sounding appalled. Yes, sent down, Mr. Blanchard repeated in husky tones. That woman, when he saw me standing in the doorway, he clipped his statement. I pressed my back against the door for a moment, wondering what I should do. Finally, I reached for the knob, turned it and practically fell into the corridor. I ran for my bedroom and flung myself onto the huge, canopied bed. In the fall of the previous year, Joel entered Oxford as a first-year law student. Traditionally, all the Everstow boys attended the famed university. Papa studied law there as did his papa and so on throughout the generations. We were all proud of Joel and glad of his apparent success. Then, I caught the governess and tutor whispering about him. They always abruptly ceased their conversations at my appearance but I knew they spoke of Joel. After much controversy, the university heads decided to expel my eldest brother. On this day of the spring equinox, he returned. It surprised us that he chose to bring with him the cause of his expulsion. Miss Charlotte Plum, I thought disdainfully. I disliked her didn't trust her, disregarded her, right from the start. Sent down indeed, I muttered, sitting up and hugging my pillow to my chest. Never in Everstow history had anyone gotten sent down. What do you think of her? Grayson asked, mincing into my room and plopping onto the bed. He grabbed another pillow and copied my stance. 
I'm trying not to, I remarked through gritted teeth. Whatever made Joel bring her here? I couldn't tell you. Gray rolled his shoulders and his eyes simultaneously. Oh, but, listen, Priscilla. He squirmed his butt around. A sure sign he had a secret to tell. After we drank the toast, Papa rang for Mrs. Cotton. He asked the housekeeper to prepare Joel's bed chamber and another one for Miss Charlotte. That Miss Charlotte made an awful face. It frightened me, Prissy. Really frightened me. Gray hugged his pillow tighter. Then Joel said. His eyes grew big and round. Joel said it wasn't necessary to make up a second bedroom. Papa told Mrs. Cotton to prepare it nevertheless. Oh, Gray, I breathed, grabbing his arm. Joel said it was too late, and that he would share his room with Miss Charlotte. Grayson sucked in his breath and hastily continued. He and that, that woman are getting married quickly. There's already a baby due, Prissy. What did Papa say? Papa didn't say anything, Gray stated, casting his eyes downward. He stared into the fire and his face turned purple and, and then he tossed his sherry glass into the flames. It burst and popped. I covered my ears with my hands and ran out. Oh, Prissy, when Mama finds out. Mama! My mind shrieked. Mama couldn't take the shock. An invalid ever since I can remember, my mother lived entirely within her own suite of rooms. She moved only from her bed to her chaise lounge and back again throughout the day. Having a weak heart, the doctor warned her against having children. However, she married Papa and provided him with an heir immediately. Grayson's birth further weakened her and mine finally made her an invalid. The slightest discomfort, the slightest sign of confusion or turmoil could easily destroy her flimsy grip on life. Whatever was Joel thinking? I gasped. He can't possibly marry that awful creature. Surely, Papa will buy her off. Pay her to care for the baby or, oh, Gray. Side by side, Grayson and I sat on the edge of my bed. My hand reached out and clasped his fingers tightly. He squeezed mine then let go. His arm stole across my shoulders and he pulled me close. Tears clung in my eyes, and I knew my brother cried too. In many ways, our lives would change drastically, mine particularly here. Chapter 2. The following morning, I awoke to find Grayson curled closely beside me. For as long as I could recall, my brother clung to me. He claimed he wished to protect me. However, I always felt him more in need of protection than me. Miss Young thought it most peculiar that we, brother and sister, should sleep together in the same bed. Nevertheless, all her attempts to stop us failed. Often Gray found his way into my chamber in the night and I awoke with him at my side. I crawled out of bed without disturbing him. Silently, I stole into the dressing room to wash and don my clothing. Mrs. Cotton served breakfast in the dining room between 6.30 and 8 o'clock each morning. I hurried downstairs and served myself with eggs and stewed kidneys from the chaffing dishes. As I sat at the table, 
Joel and his paramour entered. Papa had already eaten and continued to sit behind his newspaper. Miss Charlotte approached the sideboard with a loud, cooey, sound and began heaping her plate from the abundant selection of egg, egg bacon, kidneys, toast and grilled tomatoes. The sound of her plate thumping onto the table startled me and I stared at the massive proportions she had served herself. Joel sat close beside her with a small plate of eggs and a sausage. Presumptively, his companion speared his sausage and added it to her breakfast portion. Surely, you are not going to eat all that, I stated, rising with my empty plate. Surely, it isn't your business, Missy Prissy, Charlotte snapped back, her eyes flashing menacingly. Then, she sat back and laughed uproariously. Missy Prissy. See, Joel, dear, she cackled, prodding him with her elbow. I've made a rhyme. I shall remember that. You shall not, I commented disdainfully. I have previously explained it to you. Grayson is the only one in this house permitted to call me by that name. Let it remain that way only. I sat my plate on the sideboard and sauntered toward the door. However, when my hand touched the knob, my father called my name. I turned toward him at once. Yes, father? I calmly asked. Please, Priscilla, if you will, escort Miss Plum to your mother's chamber. Papa stated, wiping his mustaches with a pristine white napkin. I wish you to make the introduction. Yes, father, I answered noncommittally. Suddenly, I longed to escape. I wanted to spend as little time as possible in the presence of the unsavory woman of my brother's acquaintance. I'll just take a moment. Ducks, the horrid woman called. A wad of chewed toast showed when she opened her mouth. Hurriedly, she washed her mouthful down with a swallow of coffee. When she stood, I noticed for the first time her costume. The loud eggplant hue of her dress made it appear cheap despite the yards of lace on the collar and cuffs. The neckline plunged drastically, and her bosom spilled out over the top, exposing most of the voluptuous array. Inwardly, I cringed and bowing my head led the way into the corridor. Perhaps you would like to change before the introduction, I suggested, hoping to modify the sight before Mama glimpsed it. Change? Whatever for. Miss Charlotte practically bellowed. I've just put this on. Joel purchased it for me particularly in London. We did stop there before journeying on to this backwater place. My spine straightened at the word, backwater, and I clutched my hands into bald fists. Heat flared into my cheeks. Biting my tongue, I forced myself to hold back my response. Purposely, I strode to the end of the corridor and turned onto the west wing. Mama occupied the suite at the end of the hallway. Hesitating momentarily at the door, I sucked in my breath and finally entered. Miss Charlotte swooped past me immediately and approached my mother swiftly. Extending her hand, she shoved it toward my startled mother's face. Lottie Plum, the newcomer practically shouted. I'm about to marry your son, Joel Everstow. 
he knocked me up. So it is most appropriate he make it legal and all. As she spoke, the bedroom door opened silently, and Jane Grant entered. Mama's personal attendant stood at attention behind the chaise lounge. She stood poised to interrupt any turmoil the sudden announcement might create. Please, if you will keep your voice down, Jane adamantly stated. Whoever you might think you are, you cannot burst in here like a whirlwind. Lady Everstow requires complete silence at all times. Well, begging your pardon, Charlotte exclaimed, haughtily. Without further ado, she plunked onto the chaise lounge and grabbed Mama's thin frail hands. I will soon become your daughter-in-law. We should become the best of friends, Mother. Mother, indeed. I gritted my teeth. The nerve of the uncouth woman alarmed me completely. I hastily intervened. Have your breakfasted yet, Mama? I asked, scanning the room for her tray. I was just about to ring for it, Miss Priscilla, Jane stated, wringing her hands in her white apron. Shall I? Oh yes, indeed, I quipped delightedly. No one must disturb Mama before breakfast, Miss Charlotte. You see, it interrupts her digestion and we must not interrupt Mama's digestion. I wove my hand through the newcomer's elbow and swiftly drew her from the room. Who is that awful woman, Jane? I heard my mother whimper as I closed the chamber door. Why was she here? Coo, I've never seen such a weak lamb as that one, Lottie announced loudly. What keeps her alive, Prissy? Never you mind, I hissed, gathering my skirts and running along the corridor. Turning the corner onto the main hallway, I dashed toward the third floor stairway. I flung open the nursery schoolroom door and plunked into the window seat. Grayson sat at the table with Mr. Blanchard. The Bible lay open before them. Next autumn, Gray planned to go up to Oxford. He applied to study theology and, like all the family's second sons, would eventually become a vicar. At the completion of his studies, Papa would bestow the Everstow living upon him. You look quite hot under the collar, sis. Grayson stated, glancing in my direction. Was breakfast not to your liking? Papa asked me to introduce that woman to Mama, I responded, keeping my eyes on the garden pond through the nursery window. Of all the crude, impolite, forceful creatures, why ever did Joel pick her? I cannot believe. Now, now, Miss Priscilla, Miss Young cut me off. She entered the room through her connecting bedroom door and glared at me over her half-glasses. You know better than to criticize other people. Yes, Miss Young, I answered demurely. Still, Joel has some nerve bringing her here. She is with child. Grayson stated blankly. His face held a cherubic expression, and he clasped his hands demurely in front of him. The Lord has blessed her, and Joel must wed her to make the little bastard legitimate. The new baby may, after all, become the next Sir Joel Everstow. Oh and thanks a lot for that, Grayson. I spit out. I rose swiftly and flounced from the room. In a huff, I rushed into my bedroom.
flopping onto the bed. I curled up in the fetal position. Prissy? My middle brother popped his head into my room. I'm sorry, Gray, I sincerely apologized. I didn't mean to snap at you. Rarely did I speak abruptly to my sibling. Grayson became so quickly upset by sharp words. Often, he cried at the slightest criticism. I understand, Pris, he accepted. We are all unnerved by this sudden event. Unnerved isn't quite the word for it, I answered, reaching out to grasp his hand. I just cannot find a word strong enough to express in the situation. Chapter 3 Springtime delighted me. Following the long winter, the fresh breezes brought signs of new beginnings to Everstow Manor. In the afternoons, Miss Young allowed me to set my books aside. Together, we strolled through the awakening gardens. The first daffodils and crocuses appeared in the border gardens. As we strolled along, I picked a daff and set its bell against my nose. I breathed its scent deeply then twirled the stem with my fingers. Sighing, I skipped ahead of Miss Young. Walk! My governess called from behind me. Remember your deportment, Miss Priscilla. Oh, humbug, I muttered, halting my steps. I stood still for a moment and studied my feet. They were not made for dainty tiptoeing. They longed to run, skip and jump. There's no humbug about it. Miss Young stated, briskly rushing to my side. You must prepare for your London season next spring. You will not attract a husband if you insist upon skipping everywhere you go. Who says I wish to attract a husband? I responded, haughtily. Surely, I am not for sale to the highest bidder. Surely, you will do as all the other young ladies do, my companion remarked. Your mother is counting upon me to prepare you. I shall do my duty and you shall do all you can to please her. Oh, yes, surely, Claudia. I threw a coy glance in her direction. I must please my family and enter the marriage market just like all the other demure young ladies. You are pert today, miss, the governess shot out, losing her patience with me. Claudia indeed. Tis your name. I clasped my hands behind my back and skipped toward the summer house, twirling the daffodil between my fingers. My feet stopped before my body could catch up with them. I let out a loud exclamation and grabbed onto the railing. Charlotte Plum lay on the summerhouse bench with her skirts rucked up around her waist. Her long sinuous legs entwined themselves around Joel's buttocks. He plunged forward and she dug her fingernails into his naked back. Get out of here, you stupid child, Charlotte hissed, her heavily rouged mouth pursing in anger. Get, I said. Rooted to the spot, I could not move. Joel's head swiveled in my direction, a blank expression covering his face. Charlotte's hand reached out pinching his cheeks and drawing his attention back to her. I stared for a moment, then took an unguarded step backward. I missed the summerhouse steps and tumbled to the ground, landing on my derriere. Miss Young reached out to help me up. As she did, 
Her eyes grew round, and her small mouth made a perfect circle. She grabbed my arm swiftly and heaved me to my feet. I steadied myself, then pelted toward the house. I did not stop running until I reached the nursery schoolroom. Grayson leapt from the table and wrapped me in his arms. I buried my head in his shoulder and sobbed. Together, we moved to the window seat and sat close beside each other. Whatever's the matter now? Mr. Blanchard exclaimed as Miss Young entered. Mr. Joel and that Lottie woman, Claudia Young breathed, still trying to catch her breath. Priscilla came upon them, entwined, together, in the summer house. Oh dear, oh dear me! Hilliard Blanchard rang his hands together tightly. Oh dear me, yes. Miss Young pulled the bell rope swiftly. We should all need a cup of tea following that display of crudity. You rang, Miss Young, Marty asked, entering the schoolroom instantly. The youthful maid looked expectantly toward the governess. Tea, Marty, Claudia Young ordered, and quickly. Yes, Mum. The housemaid bowed a curtsy and retreated hurriedly. Marty returned several moments later with the tea trolley. The governess dismissed her and set about with the service. She handed me a cup along with a plate of cucumber finger sandwiches and freshly baked shortbreads. Grayson received a similar offering. Lovely little sandwiches, Gray murmured, selecting one and nibbling upon it daintily. When he finished, he wiped his fingers on his serviette and then dabbed at his lips. When he sipped his tea, he extended his pinky finger. I ate in a more lackluster fashion. I could not remove the sight of my oldest brother and that horrid woman from my mind. It would surely remain with me throughout the night. I squeezed Gray's arm and he nodded slightly. The gesture meant I wanted him to stay with me during the overnight hours. Hold your head higher, Miss Young sang out. Following the tea service, she decided we should practice walking. She did not like distractions and immediately set tasks to avoid lingering upon them. Higher. Come along, Priscilla, you were nearly perfect yesterday. Oh, must I, really? I cried out, swaying on one foot. The books on my head began to tumble and I reached up to steady them. Why must I walk with this pile of encyclopedia perched on my head? Deportment, my dear girl, deportment, Claudia Young called back. Keep your spine straight and, now, step. I stood rigid my back straightening along with my shoulders and head. The books swayed again, and I stretched my arms out for balance. I felt foolish. Nevertheless, I took ten steps across the room. Grayson leapt to his feet, clapping uproariously. I bowed low in acknowledgement and the heavy hardbacks cascaded to the floor. They thumped loudly. Gray and I bent to retrieve them and knocked our heads together. We both sat down hard, giggling uncontrollably. My brother stood first and began gathering the books. He returned them to the cupboard shelves. I handed him my pile, and he placed them neatly beside the others. When we turned from our task, 
Miss Young and Mr. Blanchard stood in the window aperture. His arm had stolen around her waist, and she leaned her head on his shoulder. Do you think Miss Young and Mr. Blanchard will make a match once they finish teaching us, Prissy? Gray asked, slanting his head to one side. They might marry, I dare say, I answered, coyly. But don't you think Mr. Blanchard will leave us after you go to Oxford? Another half a year will pass before I'm ready to come out. Miss Young said she will chaperone me during the season. Ah, yes, the season, Grayson sighed. Lucky you. All those eligible young men will simply fawn over my little sister. I do envy you. I glanced at my brother for a moment, unsure if he complimented me or the eligible young men. At times, Gray seemed an enigma. He kept much to himself and never seemed interested in attracting a lady. I'm unsure if I wish for young men to fawn over me, I answered, doubtfully. It seems rather primitive if you ask me. Grayson. Tis the way it's done, Miss Young interrupted in her usual brisk manner. You won't meet anyone at Everstow. We are too far away from London society. You must participate in the season, Priscilla dear. I gathered that, I answered, sharply. However, I would rather not. I would rather we stayed as we are, or as we were. Just Joel and Grayson and me, here at Everstow. Indeed, Gray muttered. And without that awful Miss Lottie, I remarked, suddenly. I do expect we will encounter her at dinner, shan't we, Prissy? My brother stated. Tis getting on. We must prepare for the evening meal. Please try not to call me Prissy in front of her, I cut in. I hate it when she calls me that. And she does copy you, Gray. I shall try. Grayson leaned forward and kissed my cheek. Chapter 4 When we arrived in the drawing room, we found Joel and Lottie seated close together on the settee. Papa stood before the fireplace lighting his pipe. Gray and I lingered in the doorway momentarily. Then Yates appeared with a tray containing sherry and five diamond-cut glasses. As soon as Papa's manservant set down his burden, Joel's paramour swooped upon the decanter. Charlotte Plum poured herself a glass then gulped it down. She refilled her glass and handed it to Joel. A stunned look crossed Papa's face. Lottie paused a moment and poured another glass for Papa. Do the children drink sherry? She asked her eyes swinging in our direction. Of course we do, I snarled, quickly offended. Children indeed. At sixteen and seventeen. Grayson and I did not consider ourselves children. We were nearly grown. Well, I thought since you two were still in the nursery, Papa might not consider you old enough to imbibe. Lottie remarked, her eyes narrowing to pinpoints. We shan't remain in the nurseries, I responded, hotly. Grayson goes up to Oxford in the fall and I shall have my London season come springtime next year. Well, certainly you shall, Lottie snapped in return. She began another remark when Yates reappeared. Dinner is served, the butler stated unemotionally. He bowed at the waist and retreated. 
Lamb shanks. I'm led to understand. Papa declared, patting his rounded stomach. Shall we? Hooking her hand through Joel's elbow, Charlotte swooped toward the dining room. Grayson and I held back. Usually Papa preceded everyone to the table. How quickly things changed, I thought, gloomily. The arrival of one uncouth woman drastically altered all our old customs. Miss Charlotte had already seated herself when Papa entered the dining room. Usually we remained standing until our father took his chair. Grayson and I glared at her, hoping she would take a hint. Nevertheless, she remained rooted in her place. Joel hovered above her, a grin plastered across his silly face. Gray nudged me and Papa cleared his throat noisily. We usually remain standing to say grace, I finally declared. That is how we usually do it, Gray echoed, edging closer to my side. Charlotte's languid eyes swooped toward us. I felt her gaze envelope me and tighten. Awkwardly, I shifted my feet. Nonplussed, Papa stood silently at the head of the table. He seemed as unsure as I felt. You can say your grace for all of me, Lottie chirped dismissively. As for me, I do not believe in mumbling prayers to a being that exists only in fairy tales. Beside me, Grayson gasped audibly. I reached out and squeezed his hand. Joel leaned down to whisper into Lottie's ear, but she shrugged nonchalantly. At the head of the table, Papa bowed his head and said grace. He sat and unfolded his napkin, placing it in his lap. Joel took his seat and Gray and I followed him. Yates pushed open the service door and indicated we were ready to begin our evening meal. The kitchen maids entered carrying covered platters. Mary Ann placed the largest before Papa. Ella set hers on the sideboard. When Father lifted the cover, the scent of minted lamb filled the dining chamber. Lor, get a load o' that. Lottie chortled, gleefully. She leaned toward Papa and sniffed loudly. Beats toad and hole any day. Surely, you don't eat toads? Grayson asked, his face crimpling in disgust. Charlotte Plum glared at my brother disdainfully. Gray shrunk down in his chair in an attempt to hide from her scrutiny. Don't tell me you've never had toad and hole, Joel's fiancé practically shouted. Loud peals of laughter echoed throughout the room. Sausages baked into Yorkshire puddings. You are rather la da da around here. Never heard of it, Gray admitted, shrinking further into his seat. I expected him to sink onto his hands and knees and crawl from the room. You should get out more, Lottie remarked, then turned to Joel. She whispered something witty into his ear and he grinned broadly. While we exchanged barbs across the table, Papa carved the lamb. He seemed determined to ignore the hostile undertones and carry on with his duty. Slices of the rich meat fell onto plates that Mary Ann scooped up. Ella added new potatoes and fresh carrots then set the full portions in front of us. Charlotte ate ravenously frequently helping herself from Joel's plate.
My elder brother kept his eyes focused on his meal and ate swiftly. The table remained silent. The usual dinner chatter forgotten. I addressed my meal with tears clinging to my eyelashes. The tension surrounding us unnerved me. Finally, Mary Ann appeared with the syllabub. I usually relished the sweetened creamy dessert, but it stuck in the throat, and I could not swallow it. Hastily, I rose and excused myself. If you will pardon me, Papa, I stated huskily, I wish to read to Mama tonight. I'll step into the library before going up. We finished Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre last night. Mama asked for sense and sensibility for this evening. You may go, my dearest, my father stated, briefly patting my hand. I leaned forward to kiss his upturned cheek. Your mother must know sense and sensibility by heart by now. You've read it frequently to her. Indeed she does, Papa, I laughed, but she does love to hear it again and again. Spinning on my heel, I skipped from the room. At the door, I stopped, thought a moment of Miss Young and began to walk more slowly. I hastened into the library but could not find the Jane Austen book immediately. It did not appear on the shelves in its accustomed spot. I diligently began to search. I tucked it into my chair. Grayson exclaimed behind me. I'll get it for you. He reached beside the cushion in the leather wing back he claimed as his own and presented the novel. Indeed, Gray, if you're reading it, I shan't take it from you. I exclaimed without accepting his offer. I'll chose something else. Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy, perhaps. I turned back to the library shelves. You take it, my brother proclaimed. Honestly, I've read it as many times as Mama. If she wants it, she shall have it. Surely. I scooped up the book and rushed away. Mama expected me at a certain time and the clock showed it past that hour. I did not wish to keep my mother waiting. Her invalidism sharply reduced her activities. She looked forward to certain occurrences at precise times. I'm sorry I'm late, Mama. I exclaimed, bursting through her sitting room door. I couldn't find sense and sensibility. Gray was reading it again. Breathlessly, I halted before her divan. Mama smiled up at me warmly. Then I noticed she already had company. Miss Charlotte Plum perched on the edge of her chaise lounge. I came up for a chat, Lottie exclaimed, cackling. Her high-pitched voice grated on my nerves. I wondered how Mama withstood the awful coarse sound of it. Mama claimed she had sensitive ears as well as sensitive nerves. We have a wedding to plan, don't we, ducks? Lottie jabbed her elbow into Mama's side. Mama winced painfully then forced a smile onto her face. I stood before her stock still, the book dangling from my hand. We shall speak together for quite some time, Lottie continued, piercing me with her malevolent eyes. You can toddle off to bed like a good little girl. Prissy. We shan't need you tonight. Good little girl, indeed. The words rankled my mind. Joel's paramour continued to treat me like a child. 
as though I were quite beneath her notice. I wanted to swing the novel at her and connect with her head, as hard as I could manage. Perhaps, I thought, it would knock some sense into her. Instead the novel dropped to the floor, and I bent to pick it up. Chapter 5 The slamming of my bedroom door brought Miss Young scurrying to my side. I stood in the midst of the room, my shoulders heaving. My heart beat wildly. Every encounter with Charlotte Plum brought me closer to the breaking point. Her crude laughter jarred me, and her loud voice sent shivers down my spine. When Joel brought that woman into our family, he brought shame to the Everstow name. Surely he knew better than to attach himself to someone so low and uncouth. I clenched my fists and pounded them into my thighs. Whatever is the matter, Priscilla? Claudia Young asked, approaching me from behind. Her gentle hands massaged my trembling shoulders. Oh, tis nothing really, I responded, swiping at my moist cheeks. It's just, turning swiftly, I wrapped the governess in my arms and burst into tears. There, there, my teacher gently soothed. She led me to the bed and made me sit down. Perching beside me, she drew me close to her side. Tell me exactly what happened. I drew in my breath to suppress my sobs. Dear Miss Young, she arrived in my life when I turned six years old. For ten years, she instructed me, and we became close friends. I knew I could rely on her and speak with confidence. When I went to read to Mama tonight that woman was already with her, I finally began. She treats me like a child and made me feel unimportant. I'm sure she didn't mean to, Miss Young stated, clasping my hand and squeezing it. Perhaps she had a few things to discuss with your mother. The wedding, perhaps? Yes, the wedding, I agreed, sighing. Do you think Joel actually means to follow through with it? I mean, well, Miss Charlotte is horrid. She's going to become an Everstow, and she doesn't fit in here, exactly. Perhaps she will learn, my governess flatly suggested. You'll have to give her time. She's still new here. It will take a bit for her to catch on. If she ever catches on, I let my voice trail away. Did people like Charlotte Plum ever catch on or did they expect everyone to stoop to their level? Time will tell, Priscilla, Claudia Young stated, rising. Get a good night's sleep and perhaps things will look better in the morning. She bent to kiss my cheek gently then bade me a good night. Good night, Miss Young, I called back sinking into my pillow. When the door closed, I turned onto my back and stared into my canopy. My mind flashed on a picture of Joel's naked body hovering above Charlotte Plum in the garden summer house. I cringed and wondered at my elder brother's actions. I felt much closer to Grayson than I did to Joel. My older sibling remained distant from us although we shared the same schoolroom. Papa raised him to become the next Lord Everstow and gave him more privileges than to his younger children. Naturally, Joel became the most important figure in our lives. The family held him to a much higher standard. Tall and lean. Joel resembled Papa. 
he kept his brown hair trimmed short and combed it neatly to the side. His blue eyes turned into limpid pools when he read poetry aloud. But they could also become cold and distant when challenged. When we rode together, Joel edged his horse close to Mr. Blanchard and spoke to him about attending Oxford University. Gray and I kept behind them while Miss Young brought up the rear. I could not recall participating in a real conversation with my older brother. While I grew closer to Grayson, Joel drifted further away. When he left for university, I barely missed him. Gray and I continued our lives as though nothing untoward had happened. Joel's return did not draw him closer to me. I felt his shame even though he chose to ignore it. I wondered if Papa felt disappointed. His high expectations for his oldest son seemed to diminish greatly. With so many things on my mind, I slept fitfully. I tossed and turned amongst my blankets, throwing them off occasionally then burrowing beneath them again. The night seemed endless. As the hours ticked by, I hoped Grayson would come in to cuddle with me. Nevertheless, my middle brother failed to appear. The following morning, I arrived at breakfast later than usual. Papa sat behind his newspaper, using it as a shield. Charlotte ate again as though ravishingly hungry. I cringed when Joel fed her scrambled eggs from his plate. I wondered about his sudden ill manners. Miss Young taught us social etiquette most particularly. I nibbled on a piece of toast and pushed my kidneys about my plate. My stomach seemed too unsettled for food. Good morning, happy family, Grayson proclaimed, trotting into the dining chamber. He stopped grinning when he noticed the dour faces at the table. Filling his plate from the sideboard, he sat in his usual place beside me. Charlotte shot him a disdainful look then prodded Joel. Rising, she tapped his shoulder, urging him to depart with her. My older brother rose obediently and, together, they strode toward the door. Just one moment, Papa called rising also. I would like a word with you, Miss Plum, in the library. At Papa's request, Miss Charlotte halted. Her back straightened and a hard look appeared on her face. However, when she turned toward my father, her smile brightened considerably, but her eyes remained dead. As you please, she responded, sweetly. Leading the way, Papa walked sedately from the dining room. Joel and Charlotte followed closely in his wake. Left alone, Grayson and I exchanged a glance. Gray raised his eyebrows questioningly. I shrugged. After a moment, we rose and strode purposefully toward the library door. Even from a distance, we could hear upraised voices emanating from the library. Miss Plum's high-pitched tones penetrated the closed door. Papa responded vehemently. Although we could not exactly make out the words, we knew the argument escalated. Gray and I exchanged a glance and leaned in closer. As we did, the door burst open, startling us. Miss Plum emerged, her face scarlet beneath her banana-colored hair. Angrily, she pushed past Grayson and me. The sour expression on her face startled us. 
Together, we backed away from her rage. Won't you reconsider? Joel questioned, appearing in the doorway. He held his hand out pleadingly. Papa? You heard me, Joel, Papa responded. I peered in quickly and saw my father sitting behind his mahogany desk. His expression appeared stricken. But, Papa, Charlotte is with child, my elder brother pleaded. You always taught me to do the right thing under the circumstances. You should have thought of doing the right thing under the circumstances in the first place, our father remarked gruffly. His sharp eyes penetrated my brother, causing him to step backward swiftly. I have a word or two to say, Lord High and Mighty, Charlotte exclaimed, marching into the room. She slammed both hands onto the desk and pressed her face close to Papa's. You won't buy me off, regardless of how much money you throw in my direction. I am here to stay. Your son impregnated me, and he promised to marry me. That's exactly my intention whether you like it or not. You're stuck with me. Pivoting abruptly, Miss Plum stomped from the library. Grasping Joel's hand, she pulled him along with her. My brother trotted along behind her hasty footsteps. Together, they mounted the stairs and continued toward Joel's bedchamber. Overcome by curiosity, Gray and I followed. Buy me off, will he? Charlotte screamed, raising an antique porcelain vase. She hurled it toward the open door where it shattered against the frame. Grayson and I dodged to either side of the open doorway. Leaning forward, we peered inside. Joel, his face as pale as ash, sat in an armchair, his face buried in his hands. Charlotte stood above him with her hands firmly at her hips. Her complexion had changed from scarlet to a deep purple. The veins in her temples stood out and throbbed uncontrollably. You promised me marriage, Joel Everstow, she shrieked as she loomed above him. You'll keep that promise or I'll shame you to the ends of the earth. Your father won't buy me off and you'll make that clear to him. Do you understand me? Yes, my pet, Joel whimpered, grasping for her hand. He fell to his knees before her and buried his head into her thick skirt. I will fulfill all my promises. I love you, love you, love you. Never leave me, Lottie. Please never leave me. Gray and I exchanged perplexing glances. The sight of my older brother groveling to that uncouth woman sent shivers down my spine. Joel became putty beneath her grasping fingers. Beside me, Grayson choked on his sobs. I grabbed his hand quickly and drew away. Poor Joel. My middle brother cried when we reached the garden. I drew in a long cleansing breath and plunked down on the summer house steps. Yes, poor Joel. Charlotte Plum owned him, lock, stock and barrel. Her tentacles reached into his heart, suffocating him. I wish she'd never come here, I exclaimed, pouting. She should have taken Papa's offer and left. It would make us all happy. Yes, Grayson concurred, sadness filling his voice. Together, we sat on the summer house steps. The sun stood high in the sky, yet we did not move. 
Neither of us felt hungry enough for lunch. In the distance, Joel and Charlotte appeared. They walked sedately around the garden and kept their heads close to each other. Both acted as though nothing untoward had happened. <laughs>